And I want to say uh, welcome to everyone. I'm Linda from the Upper Saddle River Library. I want to say welcome to Mich Michelle Frizzle from Mahjong Central. She is back with us once again. Um, hopefully we know our Charleston modeling and, and we're a little bit quicker with our strategies. And now it is time to analyze our new cards. So with that, I'm gonna let Michelle take it away. All right, thank you so much for having me here. And um, it's nice to see you all again. If anybody's in here new, nice to meet you. Um, if you haven't met me before, I've been playing Mahjong since 1973. I learned a different version though, but I've been playing with the same tiles for a very long time and I've learned a lot. So I'm all about sharing my passion and all the tips and tricks that I've learned over the years. So I hope that um, I'll be able to share some tips and tricks and uh, give you some ideas of how to have a smooth transition with the new card. It's been a little while, so I'm thinking people probably have been playing for at least two or three weeks, am I right? Most people have had their, does everybody have their card? I don't see anybody saying no, so I'm thinking everyone has their card. Excellent. All right. Well, uh, let me just explain real quick what I do every year, and then I'll, I'll go into the presentation. And I'm, I want to, I don't want to go in too deep with it because there's a lot of statistics, and I know not everybody likes number crunching. So we won't go too deep so that we can move on to uh, question and the answers. And if we have time, maybe we can do. Um, a, an exercise at Mahjong time, if we have time. So uh, what I do is I take the card from last year and the card from the, the new year, and I do a comparison of the back of the card first to find out if any rules have changed or if there's any kind of clarification. So it's always really good to just read the back of the card. I think some people even forget to look on the back of the card when they're playing and they have some kind of a debate go on about the rules. There are rules on the back of the card, but space, as you know, is limited. So I always recommend for people to buy their own copy of Mahjong Made Easy. This can be purchased on the National Mahjong League website, not sponsored. It's always good to have that little booklet though, just in case you have a debate and you need to source the rules. So once I look at the back of the card and identify any changes to the rules, I'll make a note of that. Then I go to the front or the inside of the card and I compare panel by panel, row, you know, hand by hand to see what, what the differences are. And I count hands in several different uh, attributes and patterns and shapes to try to get an idea of how strategy is going to be impacted by the card and the, and the new hands that the league has put, put together. Because this year, it's not so big of a deal, but when, whenever there's an addition category, for example, the numbers in the addition category affect other categories on the card. We don't have that situation this year, but that's just an example of how a category can affect other categories on the card. This year, that's not so much of, a, of an impact except when it comes to twos. And with that, let's get into the presentation. Unless anybody has any questions. So let's see. Oh, okay, I can share my screen. So let me pull up, let me get my presentation going and then I'll, I'll pull it up. Let's see here. Okay. Hmm. Here we go. Yeah, now there. I think this is it. Okay, now you'll have to let me know. What do you see? Yep, you, well, you're sharing your screen. I'm, I'm seeing American Mahjong. Okay, so the slideshow. Oh, there we go. Okay. Yep. Okay, so I'm going to put this up here on top. Okay, so we're going to look at uh, the card and we'll go over the statistics briefly and then we'll go into findings and then 
continue from there. So first of all, the, and many of you probably already know this, the National Mahjong League publishes their annual card with valid hands in April. Many people got their card early this year, including me. I usually get my card the second, uh, I'm sorry, the first Saturday of April, and I got my card like five days early. So I was able to jump on it and get the analysis done early, which is was a really nice surprise. And a lot of people were grateful to get the card early. So as far as American Mahjong, the rules of the game rarely change. And the methods used to, to describe the hands, those stay the same. And that would be the colors, letters, and numbers on the card. What changes is the, the hands themselves. Occasionally, the categories will change. Like this year, we don't have an addition or math play category. So the, the changes that the league makes are with the actual combinations of the hands themselves. And that includes shapes and patterns. And shapes would be like Pung Pung, Kong Kong, where there's two consecutive or two Pungs in a row and then two Kongs in a row. That would be a shape. And then you might have, for example, two suits in uh, or two, like a three suit hand where the first two blocks are one suit, the second two blocks are a second suit, and the third block is a third suit. There are some consistencies there that occur, and those would be called patterns. And these are important mainly to help you transition so that if you see something abnormal going on, it, it kind of can give you a, a little flag to slow you down to make sure that you check the card. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. I want to share some statistics briefly and then findings that can help give you insights into playing with this year's card. And hopefully, I'll be sharing some tips for a smooth transition. So again, when I uh, explained earlier on that the hand count that I do, it includes line level variations. So for example, in the quint category, quint three has two options. I count that as two hands. Some people who do these analysis, they count that as one hand, but I do count it as two. So this is the analysis by category. And all the categories are written in the left column. And I have it in descending order by this year. So you can see that the biggest category on the card is odds. And that normally is the way it is. Odds usually has the most hands, followed by consecutive run. And we're going to talk about the impact of that shortly. So just notice that odds is at the top with 13 hands, and then consecutive run, followed by wins and dragons, 369, evens, quints, and so on. And there's really not too much significant in changes. We'll kind of dig into the significant changes later. This is a hand count by, by value. So you can see on the left, we have the values of the hand, 25 points, 30 points, et cetera. In the this year column, it's sorted in descending order by count. So you can see that there are 44 hands that are 25 points. And then seven concealed hands, six singles and pairs hand, four open, four quint, and so on. The next set of statistics are analysis by attribute. And this would be things that I think are, uh, that make a difference with strategy from year to year. For example, the number of hands with pungs, cons, and quints versus the number of hands with pairs. And it's interesting because Lynette and I were talking about this before we went on, and she had mentioned that there are a lot of hands with pairs, and there are actually, but there are way more hands with pungs, cons, and quints. 57 hands have bigger multiples, and that multiples would be pung, con, quint, any big grouping of numbers. So the hands with pairs, there are 48, and then incidentally, there are six more than last year. So that's a bit noteworthy. Uh, there are 40 hands in mixed suits, 
and 27 hands with flowers, 26 hands with like numbers. There are 20 hands with pairs of flowers, 18 hands in one suit, and then 18 hands with dragons, 13 with winds. And so these, these are not all of the different attributes, but these are the highest level of hand, hand count by attributes. So these are the ones that I think are most significant that can impact strategy. The next one is a comparison of between last year and this year. So the hands with wins, we have two more than last year. Hands with pairs, six more than last year. We have four fewer hands in one suit, three fewer options in like numbers, three fewer with Kongs of flowers, and the quince stayed the same. This is the recurring hands or recurring shapes, sorry, recurring shapes and prevalent patterns. So this is important because when you're playing, if you are gathering tiles and you see that you have Pung Kong, Pung Kong, well, that fits this year, but last year it was Pung Pung Kong Kong. So these are the predominant patterns that you wanna think about when you're playing. The most predominant two patterns are pair Pung Kong, Pung pair, which is a pyramid. Some people call it a bell curve. And then the other one is Pung Kong, Pung Kong. So three, four, three, four, Pung Kong, Pung Kong. And then one less, we have pair and then triple Kong. So these are the most predominant shapes on the card. Sometimes there are two, but this year we kind of have three. It's a bit dispersed. So here are the findings after looking at all those statistics on what kind of impact is that going to make when we play the game. And I think I give you some advice in here as well. So regarding the hand value, I think this is a relatively easy card because 66% of the hands have 25 points and that's six more than last year. So I'm predicting that there will be shorter games and fewer wall games. Time will tell. The carryover hands are evens number six, wins number one, wins number six with two options, three, six, nine, number six with two options. So that can kind of help you a little bit. I, I don't feel like there's much. It's typically about 10% of the hands are carryover from year to year. These are the significant per percentages that will impact strategy. 85% of the hands have pungs, cons, and quints. So the point here is to build around multiples. And society, Jewish Genealogical Society of New York's website. Um, and if you're looking at a different area, I would contact the local Oops, okay. <laughs> I thought that was a question. No, um, I think whoever just came in, I it had to mute. But. Okay, well, so the idea here is 80, around, it's always around 80%, but there are 85% of the, of the hands on the card are puns, cons, and quints. I call those big multiples. So if you build your hand around multiples, you're going to set yourself up for success because American Mahjong is a game of multiples, and especially this year with 85% of the hands having pungs, kongs, and quints, you'll be able to optimize your hand if you start there. Now, you don't always have multiples when you first get your hand. So in that case, you wanna build around the predominant pattern, and that would be a category, let's say, if you have more evens than odds, for example. So if you have more evens, gather evens until you have a multiple then reassess and build around the multiple. Because again, there are 85% of the hands on the card use pairs or punks, cons, and quints. Also, 72% of the hands have pairs. That's six more than last year. And the key here is, especially if you have two pair in your, in, for the hand that you're going for, be careful to commit with an exposure if you don't have at least one of those pairs in your hand. If you have singles, 
for two pair and you ex make an exposure. And then even if you go further with another exposure, you could be painting yourself into a corner. I typically won't commit to a hand or make an exposure unless I have one of two pairs made in my hand. So keep that in mind. If you have two pair that will become part of your hand, commit with an exposure if you have one of those pairs ready made. Otherwise, wait until you have at least one made. Otherwise, it can get a little tight. Next, we have 60% of the hands have mixed suits with or without dragons. If you look on the card, when you see a dragon with a hand that is the same suit, it's one color. So that's considered one suit. Uh, in the case of mixed suits, of course, you're gonna see multiple colors. The idea here is that if you are in mixed suits, hold opposite dragons. So if you're collecting bams and cracks and you happen to get a white dragon, you might hold it because there may be a mixed suit hand that you could play with that opposite dragon. There are categories with opposite dragons in evens, consecutive run, odds, and three, six, nine. And an opposite dragon basically means you have number tiles in one suit, let's say, and then the dragons in the two other suits. So that would be an example of opposite dragons. There are 40% of the hands have flowers in them. This is why it's very risky to pass flowers. Now, any advice that I give is just that. It's advice. It's not a rule. It's a guideline. And, and I follow the advice I give is how I play. So sometimes, depending on what I have, I may pass a flower. I may even pass a pear. It just depends on how close I am to my hand and the value of that hand. Passing risky, like a flower, like numbers or a pair, you, you've got to think about the situation in your own hand and the situation at the table and kind of count the costs of either passing risky tiles or discarding risky tiles. Uh, of course, you want to build your hand first and let that be the priority, but you also want to think defensively, not only with your passing, but once you get to the pick and discard phase of the game, you're discarding. 39% of the hands have like numbers. This is one reason why I cringe whenever I receive like numbers in a pass because with like numbers being in 39% of the hands, if someone gives me like numbers, there's a pretty good potential that either it will fit my hand and build it, or it'll give me enough fodder to switch and leverage those like numbers because 40 almost 40%, 39% of the hands on the card use like numbers. So if, uh, if I get to a place in the Charleston where I have maybe three discards, I would consider passing like numbers because I'm pretty close to a winning hand, but it's very risky, almost as risky as passing a pair, in my opinion. Next, we have 27% of the hands use dragons. This is comparatively higher than wins. So if you are passing and you have the option of passing dragons or wins, try not to pass two dragons, break it up with a wind, maybe a dragon and then a number tile. So try not to pass two dragons at a time. That would be uh, pretty close to passing like numbers. It's, it's about that same risk level. So try to break up dragons. It's okay to pass them, but try not to pass two in, in one pass. And again, it really depends on where you are with your hand, how close you are to making it. Uh, and then you would just make the decision thereafter. If you're very close to a hand and you feel the risk is worth it, then by all means pass two dragons. But I try to do that rarely, especially white dragons, because those are a dual tile. So just be, be mindful when you're passing dragons. The next statistic is 19% of the hands are in odds. The interesting thing about that number though, is that the consecutive run category was only, I, I don't recall how many um, down, I think maybe two or three hands off. The thing about the consecutive run category is that it is 
way more flexible than odds. You need specific numbers in odds, but with consecutive run, you have flexibility to go one way or another, depending on your passing or when you're in the pick and discard phase of the game, the tiles that you pick or the tiles that are discarded to complete your exposures. So the beauty of consecutive run is the flexibility of all those numbers, nine numbers in a range versus one, three, five, seven, nine specific numbers. So even though odds has more hands, consecutive run is the most flexible category on the card. And that is typically true year to year. So keep that in mind. If you're between odds and consecutive run, you have an equal number of tiles, consider going with consecutive run because of the flexibility. Any questions at the moment? If not, I'll keep going. These are noteworthy patterns. There are no knitted hands. And knitted is when you have two suits with a matching dragon. And so it would be, for example, 369 with the dragon. The first and second block are one suit. And then the middle block is the second suit with the matching dragon. That is called knitted. And there are none this year. The other is that math play is off the card. These are some noteworthy shapes. 28 shapes are on the card. That's two more than last year, but they're more dispersed. So the count is fewer for those 28 shapes. And the bottom line here is before you make your first exposure, double check the shape of that hand and make sure you're making the right exposure, whether it's a Pung or a Kong, for example. And also make sure, let's see, I wonder if we get to concealed. That kind of applies to concealed and exposed. Before your first exposure, check to see if you're playing a concealed hand because there's nothing worse than the feeling than putting out a Pung and later realizing that, oops, I'm playing a concealed hand. Uh, the next shape is pyramid hands. That would be Pung, Kong, let's see, oh, pyramid hands and Pung, Kong, Pung, Kong. They're equally represented. We kind of went over that on the statistics one. Pair triple Kong is a close second there with six. We have quints of flowers outside the category again this year. They're in two hands, consecutive run number four and 369 number four. The interesting thing about playing quince is to secure your pairs before claiming a discard to make an exposure. And the other thing to consider is the number two, because this year we have two twos in the year category. So if you're playing something consecutive, including in quince, there are three hands in there, really four, because one is an option. They use consecutive run, and two of them use pairs. So make sure that you have at least one of those pairs secured before you commit to an exposure, or you could be painting yourself into a, cor a corner, especially if you expose a quint because people can narrow down your hand. And if you're committed with two quints and you have singles for your pairs, and then all of a sudden the pairs are in exposures or discarded, you're gonna get stuck. So try to have one of your pairs secured before you commit. You can always use jokers if you let a tile go. The other fact that you can count on is with consecutive run, not only in the quince category, but in the consecutive run category, and that has to do with twos. Consider starting your run at three because with the year being 2021, twos are gonna be a hot commodity and you may not get them. If someone's playing a year hand or if someone's playing two, four, six, eight or both, you could have two players at the table, one playing a year hand, one playing two, four, six, eight, twos are gonna be at a premium. So consider starting your consecutive run at three. Now, if you already have your twos in hand, like a pung, or I'm sorry, let's say a, a pair of twos or even a pung of twos, I suppose, then pay it, you know, don't, don't be concerned about it in that situation. But if you don't have your twos or you need a pair, you might consider inching it up a bit and starting at three. 
these are the hot commodities and I know twos are gonna come in here. So there'll be no surprises there. Flowers, there's one less flower hand, but there are five with Kongs, three with quints. So flowers are still going to be a very hot commodity. And this really is year to year. I, I think anytime you have quints on the card of flowers, it's even a, a little more hot. So this I think is why passing flowers is very risky. And then you also want to discard flowers before the fourth wall. Those are gonna be very risky tiles to discard in the fourth wall. The other uh, hot commodity will be year tiles. So that would be ones, twos, white dragons primarily. These will be very risky to pass. If you have to pass them, pass one at a time. Try not to pass, for example, a one and a two together. And try not to pass one, two wind because that could fit both in the wind and dragon category, but also in the year category. So just be mindful to split them out if you can. Quince has two consecutive hands, number two and number four, but uh, actually three, I have to update that. There are three consecutive hands and one has two options. So if you, again here, this is where I mentioned, if you do not have twos, consider starting your consecutive run at three. And that, uh, let's see, in the consecutive run category, except for the two option hand at the top, um, all the others, incidentally, you can start with any number. This has been quite a controversy this year with, uh, let's see, which hand is it? It's uh, hand number five. You can start that run with any number as long as it ends in nine. So for example, you can do seven, eight, nine, or five, six, seven. You can start anywhere. You just can't go from nine back to one. So even though it doesn't say in there that it's any, any, any three consecutive numbers, there's no room for that. You can start that run at any number as long as you don't go beyond nine. Singles. Right. So that was the one little thing, because in that particular hand, if everybody's seeing it, where it starts with the one, two, three, because it doesn't say consecutive numbers, but since it's in the consecutive run hand, yeah, it just didn't have room in it, right? So any one or three suits. Yep. Um, also, uh, note in singles and pairs, number three, there are going to be a lot of twos there. And then, of course, we have the big hand with twos. So these are just all the all the hands and the situations where you want to be really careful with twos. Like numbers also, and then east and west with twos. There'll be impact there. So just be very mindful when you're working with twos. Try to either have them in your hand or play something else because you might not get the twos. And then in reality for the 2021, the third one down, that's essentially a quint of twos. Yeah, it is, but it's in two different blocks. So you have a Kong that will require a Joker, right. and then you'll have a single two one. So you and since you cannot use a Joker in a with a single a block of single tiles like two one, you can't use a Joker there, which means that you have to save one of your twos for that single block. So you're going to have to have a a Joker for that hand, one Joker minimum. And I think we talk about that in a minute. Um, so dragons, there's an increase in hands, two more than last year. So dragons will be a hot commodity again, as I was sharing before. Um, and now there are no double dragon hands in the year category, but there are double dragon hands in several categories. We have any like numbers, there's a double dragon hand. There's a double dragon hand in consecutive run and there's a double dragon hand in the winds and dragons category. So just be very careful when you're passing dragons. For discarding, it's not so much a concern, but through the Charleston, you wanna just be very careful when you discard or when you pass dragons. Uh, let's see. Okay, news, there are six hands three have big multiples with news. For example, the very first news hand, uh, wind and dragon hand, it's news, but they're big multiples. It still spells news, 
If you were to break all those out, you would have a couple of blocks that spell N-E-W-S. But because they're blocked like that, Kong, Pung, Pung, Kong, it still spells news. And then there are, there's a singles of news with east and west in a couple of hands, the concealed news hand, and then the single and pair hand, the very first one. And then we also have a single news hand in like numbers. So consider using caution when passing wins. Try not to pass two wins together and consider how close you are to completing your hand towards the end of the Charleston to, to decide whether or not you want to risk passing two wins at a time. Because if somebody's playing news or if somebody's playing um, any news big multiple hand, you could really build their hand for them. So I try to break my wins out in and pass one at a time if I can. Okay, so the fatal errors, and this is where we can talk about that third hand down. Kongs of twos with a Kong of white dragons, year number three. This is where if anyone has a Kong of white dragons and then they have a Kong of twos, they're trying, the only hand that they could be playing with twos like that would be that third hand down. And they need to have a natural two for the two one. So that's gonna be a problem. And if anybody at the table is uh, aware, that hand could be declared dead. So just be really careful if you're playing that hand and make sure that you save a natural tile for your 2-1. The potentially problematic parenthetical, say that three times fast and I'll give you a brownie. Evens number eight and singles and pairs number four the like pungs or pairs respectively must be the same, but they can be twos, fours, sixes, or eights. Those are the only two that there usually is a little more flexibility on the card. For example, with three, six, nine, a lot of times you'll have the choice of three, sixes, or nines in like pungs or like kongs. But this year they didn't give us that flexibility. And that I was a little surprised. The third hand down under three, six, nine is an example where that would have been a really uh, it, nice place to have that kind of an option. But they decided to have big multiples in one suit and then like pungs in the other two suits with no flexibility. So just make sure that you're double checking the flexibility for the two hands, evens and singles and pairs, they can be any number as long as they're evens. For winds and dragons, north and south go with odds, east and west, west go with evens, and you choose the number. So it doesn't, for, if you're playing north and south with odds, it doesn't have to be number one. And if you're playing east and west with evens, it doesn't have to be twos. It could be either north and south with any odd number as long as they're the same and east and west with evens, any number as long as they're the same. For consecutive hand or consecutive run number five, all the hands in this category except the first one can start with any number as long as it ends with nine, as I shared earlier, you can't go back to one. So for example, you can't do eight, nine, one, or you can't, so you wanna start your consecutive run anywhere as long as it ends in nine. That is pretty well understood for most American Mahjong players, but some people new to the game, especially coming from another version might have a little hard time with that. Consecutive run number eight, opposite dragons mean, means all three suits must be represented. So the dragons represent the missing number tiles. So if you're playing that concealed hand under consecutive run, a pair of flowers, let's say you have one, two and cracks, then you're gonna need to have dots and bams represented, which means you'll need the white dragon and the green dragon. So you have all three suits represented. All right, now we're gonna talk about tandem categories. And this is switchability. If you are playing in a particular category, there are some categories that play well together. I, that's why I call them tandem. If you think about a tandem bike, they kind of ride together, but at some point you're gonna to have to make a choice and go with one or the other. But for a while you can play two different categories 
And these are the categories that work well together to a point again. Uh, so at some point you have to choose. The first one is the year category with evens and even like numbers using twos. So if you're playing a year hand and white dragons go down, you could consider switching to either like numbers or evens. Evens and consecutive run with fillers. So basically, if you're playing two, four, six, eight, and you start getting threes and fives, you can easily switch to consecutive run. Those are the fillers, the threes and fives. So consider that if you start get drawing sometimes your hand wants to be consecutive. So you'll start seeing threes and fives if you're playing a two, four, six, eight. The same, uh, oh, let's see, like numbers. Like numbers, it, you can switch to almost any category on the card. Every category on the card uses like numbers. And three, six, nine, I have found is a really good switch to like numbers, primarily because you have only three numbers there. And more times than not, you're gonna have like numbers with either threes, sixes, or nines. So I have found that three, six, nine and like numbers especially are really good switchable, they're really good switchable categories. Quince to consecutive run and like numbers, and that applies to this year. As I shared earlier, there are four hands, one with an option that are consecutive run. So you could be playing in consecutive run. And if you're not committed already, if you draw a bunch of jokers or do some joker exchanges, you may be able to switch to a quint depending on how many jokers you have and vice versa. If you're trying for a quint and you don't happen to get the jokers you need, you can switch to the consecutive run category because there are four hands that are in the quint category. There'll be a really easy switch, I think, to consecutive run or even like numbers. Because if you look this, let's see here, this, the, it's not concealed, the fourth hand down has like numbers, one, two, one, two. So you have two sets of like numbers there. So you might be able to switch to like numbers if that doesn't quite come in for you, or if, you're, if your pairs don't come in, you can switch to like numbers using the bigger block if you're not committed. Of course, if you make an exposure with a quint, you're committed. So stay concealed until you have those pairs. For consecutive run, there's a good switch to evens or like numbers. Oh, I'm sorry, my eyes switched to the first bullet, the bullet above. Consecutive run to evens or odds. And this is kind of the opposite of consecutive run and evens. There you need fillers, but with evens or consecutive run to odds, you need to omit. So if you're playing, for example, um, one, let's see, if you're playing two, three, four, five, you could switch to little odds using three, five, just by omitting the two and the four. If you get ones, you can switch to little odds. So just think about omissions. If you're, if you happen to not draw well for a consecutive run, you may be able to switch to odds. And then consecutive run could switch to evens with those same kind of omissions. Odds can switch to like numbers and consecutive run with fillers. Wins and dragons can switch to the year and like numbers. And the like number one is just the one hand, second one down with either north and south with odds or east and west with even. So not so much with like numbers, but definitely between the year category and the wind and dragon category. Because if you notice the second hand from the bottom under winds and dragons has a block of year tiles. And then finally, uh, 369 to odds. And that's primarily because there are two of the three tiles are odd. There's a big spread though. So if you start drawing ones and fives, you might consider switching to odds. And then singles and pairs is tandems well with any category on the card except for quince. And that's primarily because with quince, you have big multiples. And if you're going from a pair hand all the way up to a quint, you're going to have to draw really well, including drawing jokers. So it's a stretch. All right. These 
are the top three mistakes when playing with a new card. You may be used to it by now, and you'll have to let me know once we close down this presentation if any of you have had these problems. The first one is passing risky tiles in the Charleston. Flowers, dragons, and ear tiles are going to be risky. Hold them or pass them individually. Claiming a discard before an exposure on a concealed hand, not before an exposure, for an exposure. Always check the X or C before you claim your first discard. Playing a hand from the previous year. These are the top three mistakes that happen every year. And most of the time people giggle at the table when it happens. And usually there's grace given. All right, so here are tips for a smooth transition. Do hands-on exercises at home if you have a set of tiles. Category modeling is a great exercise. We did a little bit of that virtually uh, in the last presentation. This is when you get a drawn set of tiles and you set up a mock Charleston and you make decisions pass by pass to practice making decisions with the new card. Oh, sorry, that was category modeling. That's where you build every hand on the card and you work with the different flexibility and limitation based on the text in the parentheses. So that would be category modeling first, then Charleston modeling. That helps you improve your decision making. And then there's an exercise I call Charleston chain reaction. This is a great exercise to train your in or test your instincts. So you create a mock Charleston again. So you have three sets of tiles, six rows high. You have a drawn set of tiles. And then you take a picture of every incoming pass and you make decisions. And then you rebuild the hand and the Charleston passes based on the photos so that you can do it again with a different plan in mind. Like let's say you play consecutive run on the first go round, but the second go round, maybe you focus on like numbers and then you compare the results. It's a really fun exercise and you can learn a lot about your instincts and where you might need to grow in identifying the strength of a hand. Also, Charleston sprints. This is really good if you want to play online or if you ever plan to play in a tournament. And this is where you use a timer or your smartphone app and you time yourself through the Charleston making decisions in under two minutes if you can. It, and that's what I recommend for advanced players. For intermediate players, I recommend three minutes. And then for beginners, four minutes but try to get down to making decisions in under two minutes. And if you have four discards or less at the end of the Charleston with that quick decision-making, I'd say you're ready to play in a tournament or play online comfortably. And then also we have Charleston Force. And this is where you create a strip for every category on the card. And then you pre-select three strips and you force hands in those categories with Charleston modeling. So you'll set up the Charleston modeling, the mock Charleston, and with those three pre-selected categories, you'll force a hand in one of them and then take the category away when you've gotten to the, the end of the Charleston and see how you did. And then you try to force hands for two categories and then force a hand for one category. One time I started with one tile and I actually ended up in pretty good shape you can really make just about anything work because American Mahjong is a very flexible game if you make the right decisions at the right time. And then you can play solitaire. I don't know if any of you have seen my solitaire videos, but this is when you play four hands at one time. And the key here is you have to be able to uh, compartmentalize your decision making so that you're not affected by what you see in the other hands. You play one hand at a time and make decisions for that one hand and as you pick, you know, go through the Charleston and pick and discard focusing on one hand at a time, there are a lot of great lessons that you can learn by playing solitaire. Also play live often if it's safe in your area and if you're comfortable with that. Play with peers to relax and have fun and then try to find a more advanced group to push yourself. You'll learn a lot if you play with a group that's maybe a little more advanced than you. It, it kind of pushes you in different ways than always playing with people of the same skill level. 
also consider playing online if you don't. I like to play at Mahjong time. They have a really great platform. The, I think it's the most realistic. And uh, I think you might, if you've been in any of the previous presentations, you've seen the game played there. And if we have time, we could maybe take a peek and you could see what it's like. And I am an affiliate there, affiliate partner. So I can give you a free VIP trial if you would like to give it a try. But playing online is another great way to help you make a quick transition from the old card to the new card. It's a bit anonymous when you're playing there. So you can kind of save face. If you make mistakes, nobody's going to call you on it. Whereas if you're playing in person, you know, you might, you might get a little embarrassed if you make one of those top three mistakes. And then of course you can watch my videos on YouTube. I have a lot of skill builders there. I've already got a lot of videos for the 2021 card. And I play, uh, I do what's called a let's play live stream on Friday nights and we'll socialize a little bit, but we do gameplay with commentary on the new card. It's a lot of fun. So if you are free on a far Friday night, go to my YouTube channel and you can join us and play some Mahjong and join in the socialization while we play live. It's a lot of fun. Uh, let's see, also, uh, I do have a special series called Strategy Theory and that focuses on strategy. So there's no socialization. It's just gameplay with strategy. Oh, that's what's, that's the next list. Okay, that's it. Everybody doing good? Any questions? So if people want to have a question, would like to unmute themselves. Here we go. I'm going to take you off the spotlight. So if people have, have a question, like I said, we were talking before about the one in three hand, which was interesting. One in three. Uh, yeah, with the with the any one or three suits, but you already explained that with the consecutive. Oh, run. oh okay. Yeah, I don't think that it, it, sometimes with a, a new card, there's some kind of a controversy, you know, some kind of a, a, a troublesome spot. And really the only one is that fifth hand down where the league did not have the space to say, any three consecutive numbers. There's just no space. But because it's in the consecutive run category, you can start it with any number. So I, there's really no other troublesome spot that I have heard of. So uh, I'm always keeping my, my ears open though, but I've not heard of any other trouble on the card except for that one. I do see that in social media being questioned often. And then I did have a question. So in the singles and pairs, um, the fourth one down, where it says at the at the end, it has the two twos, the two sets of twos, but it can really be two, four, six, or eight, just as long as it's the other suits, correct? Yes. Any like even knows. Okay. That's what they, they mean. Any you can use as long as those numbers are the same they could be any even number. They just have to be the same. So for example, you couldn't do a pair of fours and a pair of sixes. You have to do a pair of twos in two suits there, opposite of the one that has two, four, six, eight, or it has to be two fours, two sixes, or two eights. So as long as those two pairs are the same number and they have to be evens. And I don't know why they didn't put maybe due to space again. I mean, they did put any like even knows, but you know, some people do have a little trouble translating that because it's different than the concealed hand under evens where it says like pungs two, four, six, or eight. So, you know, they weren't consistent there. And so I think that may give people pause, but it's the same thing. Now, does anybody else want to unmute themselves or, or put in the chat a certain question if you've tripped up over something? If, if people have actually been playing, I'm curious if people have been playing, playing a little bit online with the new card. Um, again, like as you said too, I did make the mistake one time of, I, I told you this before too, on the any like numbers, the third one where it's only three like and then four dragons and I exposed four. So I'm like, <laughs> 
I, I guess I'm playing a like number with four, four you know, with a gong. <laughs> so yeah. it, it happens. <laughs> yeah, it does. And the nice thing though is if, if you had just the one exposure, you still have a lot of flexibility to recover from that mistake. American Mahjong with its flexibility is forgiving until you have two exposures. When you have two exposures, it's it can be very challenging to switch. Sometimes you can't, but um, if you just have one exposure, you can switch your hand pretty easily, I think. So um, I don't, I've been playing uh, since the first week in March and I have uh, lots of dots. I dot my card. I don't know if any, any of you do that. When you win a hand, you put a dot on it. I challenge myself to win every hand on the card in the year before the next card comes out. And it feels really good. I like this card. I, I don't have any complaints about it at all. It was a, when I first got it, I was a little surprised to see single East and West. I don't know if I've ever seen that before where they have like, um, you know, bigger multiples in North and South and then those single East West. So it took me a little while to think about that when I was playing the hand. I remember one time I was playing news concealed and I forgot the shape of the hand and that it, it, I was collecting like flowers and I thought, oh, wait a minute, you need dragons there. So I switched to the third hand uh, down instead. But when, it, you know, those kinds of things might happen. You know, the last year's card will come into your head. The nice thing about playing a concealed hand though is you're not committed. And so you can switch if you happen to make a mistake with your concealed hand and you can switch to an exposable hand and recover. And then I did put uh, your YouTube channel and it's also, as I, I said before too, I will, uh, Michelle has, has graciously the, given us the presentation, the slide presentation. So I will send that out to everybody. So you guys can kind of go back and really look at the numbers that she did. And on it, she also has, um, she's mahjongcentral.com. And I put even in the group chat as well, your YouTube channel. Um, the, the different strategies that you're talking about, Michelle has tons of videos on that YouTube channel that really can help you uh, a kind of, how do you do this? How do you do a Charleston sprint? How do you do, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the Charleston modeling? It can help you with that. And, and this is now, I believe our third workshop. So mm -hmm. they're on the Upper Saddle, they'll be on the Upper Saddle River Library YouTube page as well. So if nobody else has any questions right now, I guess everybody's really anxious to go out and play online. I don't know. <laughs> all right. Do they want to put in the chat at all? Okay. And then also too, Michelle was mentioning before you guys came on something about possibly uh, exploring a virtual Mahjong tournament. So I will follow up with you on that. And uh, I appreciate if everybody has my email as well. If you think you would be interested in that, let me know. Um, I can see how we explore it. Uh, we, our library has hosted in-person tournaments years ago, but not obvious, you know, that person retired. So <laughs> well, if you ever want to do ever. that, I, I'd be happy to help or give you or put you in touch with someone who can help. Oh, and, great. Um, yeah, I, I hope that uh, you all found this information helpful. I know there was a lot of number crunching, so um, please bear with that process. It really does make a difference. So the next time you want to do some light reading, you can peruse those numbers and see how it might affect the way you play the game. I have a question. Sure. Give me. Are you allowed to use like that as a cheat sheet? Like, is it? Like if I print that out on an eight and a half by 11, those statistics, can I look at it while I'm playing? Well, I, I, I don't know if I can remember all that. No, you no. really don't need to. It's really more about uh, trends. So the changes from year to year, it, it's like a ripple, have a ripple effect throughout the card. And that's why I do the analysis because it shows slight changes and even big changes that could happen in certain categories, depending on the usage of the tiles, the shapes of the tiles. For example, 
quince of flowers and things like that. So just um, if you just, what I would recommend is looking over the analysis maybe a day or two before you were to play again and then don't take it with you though i don't know if players would appreciate you looking at a uh, well they could look at it too i'd give it to oh. <laughs> i was thinking you were gonna you pass it around the table. let me pull up my analysis here <laughs> Bear with me while i look at my statistics. well i'm just saying just like we all count yeah. you know i'm six away from this i'm seven away from that and, mm -hmm. you know but the there are a lot of things that you pointed out that maybe you're better off for going with one that you need an extra tile, but it's going to be easier to find. And mm -hmm. I, I've analyzed the game myself before, as far as pairs, but I can't use a joker and things like that. But I've never, um, I mean, this is very interesting to me how deep the analysis is and how much there is to uh that goes into it i'm a bridge player so oh. I, I am so i you oh. know a lot of um i play a lot more bridge than i do mahjong and bridge but is i'll say if anybody wants to um you know i'm well i'm interested in doing an outdoor game or you know i'll, I'll even play indoors i had shots but if anybody wants to play um i would love a list of players numbers or you know anybody that wants to um well again if anybody okay. wants to contact if anybody wants to contact me i will definitely uh you know and feels free passing along information they, they well, can I, i'll give you my number and you can okay give it out feel free to give my number <laughs> okay. anybody who needs to play it. Uh -oh, there goes but i think you also had a good point with um when you were talking to about taking tiles out if you own your own set and you take your tiles out and you actually recreate these sometimes some people it sticks more if you can actually just instead of looking at the card you actually visually see it, the tiles yeah and i know you've done videos on that as well and that can i found that could be a helpful really helpful as well to yeah. instead of bringing the cheat sheet to it's just another way of visually seeing it yeah, it's kind of like doing calisthenics or stretches before you go out and run. You know, you want to get your mind ready for a game. So maybe do some Charleston modeling the day before you play, or maybe do it weekly as kind of a solitaire exercise to get your mind active when you're at home. Just because you don't have other players to play with, if you have a set of tiles at home, you can play solitaire. It really is a lot of fun, but I must say, be prepared to make mistakes because uh, sometimes you might forget to discard for somebody and then you'll have one player with too many tiles and you'll have to throw it in and start over so just make sure that you are very careful when you pick and discard and that you're on the right player's rack it's easy to skip turns and things like that so you really have to concentrate when you're doing solitaire but a lot of people really enjoy playing solitaire and you can find videos on how to set it up on my youtube channel if you want to know and, and of course um you could send me an email if you need help in setting it up but it really is a lot of fun and it's a great way to spend a few hours playing with your tiles okay well with that i would like to say thank you very much michelle thanks once again for virtually coming to uh, the Upper Saddle River Library. I will definitely be in touch with you as you know you will because I am a fan and I do <laughs> like to play and I am trying to get better. <laughs> so uh, with that, thank you everyone. Thank you for, thank for joining you so us. Thank you.